conference. So we continue with more and now we have Jay Miller who will give us his talk about building Twitter campaigns with Azure QS, where he will tell us about sending tweets with Azure and tweet by to automate that process. Um, Jay is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft based in San Diego, CA, a multi-potentialite, sorry. <laughs> Jay enjoys finding unique ways to merge his fasc fascination with productivity, automation, and development to create tools and content to serve the tech community. So here we have Jay and yes. Hey, Hi, Jay. how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So how are you? I'm doing great. It's a, it's a, you know, quiet Saturday evening. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the stuff that I did over the last few months and uh, happy to connect with people. Really, really nice. I, yeah. Where are you joining us from? Um, I don't know. What time is there? Uh, I'm in San Diego, California, so it's 6 p.m. here. Great. All right. So, um, well, Jay, the stage is yours. Uh, sure. Let's see if we can get our our screen shared, and then we'll, we'll be ready to take off. There we go. Actually, I just realized we're on YouTube. We don't need closed captioning. There we go. Full screen. I like that instead. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jay Miller. Uh, as was mentioned before, I'm a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft. Uh, I focus mostly on Python things well, and not sharing my slides, apparently. Let's try that again. It's not wanting to work. There we go. Perfect. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I decided to take on the fun and fantastic challenge of not only building a Twitter bot, but building a Twitter campaign. Uh, you might be wondering what the difference is. Uh, this wasn't its own Twitter account. This was me allowing the internet to send things on my account, which is uh, dangerous, but also it was a lot of fun and we did it in the safest way possible. And I want to break down a little bit of how we were able to do that. But the first step was why. Um, October is in the US at least it is ADHD Awareness Month. Uh, it is a month where folks who have ADHD like myself, um, hi, I have ADHD, PTSD, uh, and general and social anxiety, uh, among a slew of other things. But uh, it's a time to recognize those individuals and encourage other folks to consider seeking a diagnosis if they think that that would benefit them. So uh, I did this survey uh, through a series of Twitter spaces and blog posts and many other things, even a couple of conferences. Uh, last year, I actually spoke at this conference about some of the things that I had learned from other people with having ADHD, and I wanted to share that with the world. So I decided to take the anonymous messages of encouragement that people had filled out via survey and send a message once a day anonymously, you know, on my Twitter account. And it was, it was a great experience and a great campaign. And I hope that it, uh, made an impact in some folks' lives. So for this talk, we're going to be addressing Twitter's API. Uh, don't worry. Uh, we're going to be talking about Azure storage queues and how I use them. We're going to be talking about some of the benefits and drawbacks of, of using them as well and figuring out what is ultimately the best plan of, of attack for this. And also maybe even start to think about some different ways to use these queues as well. But, um, I don't know if you've noticed lately, Twitter's, kind of in a, a weird space right now. Yeah, it's it's complicated. Uh, I chose to do this. I'm actually still on Twitter, <laughs> um, but obviously I am, I have my own concerns, but uh, one of the biggest ones is getting access to Twitter's API. So uh, I will tell you, uh, in order to do what I did, you will need access to Twitter's API, but also 
even though Twitter's API plays a big role in this talk, it's the way that we've designed things. Hopefully it doesn't mean that it has to be the only way that you can use this. So if Twitter's not your thing, insert other service here and roll with it. But for us, Twitter's the thing. If you wanted to do this, you would need two different uh, pieces of access. One that is free and has no review required, uh, and that allows you to send text. I believe you can also send things like Twitter polls, um, and it gives you access to Twitter's V2 API, their, their newer API. Uh, if you want something like storing assets for like videos or images and you want to tweet those things out, you do need to request access. Uh, there's You can use these QR codes. I'm going to give a little bit more time just to make sure that people have selected those if they want to. Uh, yeah, you'll have to ask for that. It took me 24 hours to get access. It took one of my colleagues about 15 minutes. Again, I don't, I don't know how to help with that. All I can say is um, fill it out. The next thing you'll have to do is you'll have to set your access tokens to read and write. Uh, I'm going through this really quickly. There are a lot of great demos on how to build a Twitter bot that go through these steps. But if you've never done it before, and sometimes Twitter's policies do change, uh, I just wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, what you are going to need are those uh, consumer keys at the top, the uh, API key in secret. And you're also going to need the access token in secret. But by default, your access token in secret are for read only permissions. And the only way that you can get read and write permissions is to generate uh, OAuth 2.0 client ID in secret and then regenerate your access token in secret again and it'll be recreated with the new permissions. And then you might be wondering how we actually access the Twitter API. We've talked about how you get access to it, but once you have that access, how do we actually utilize it? And you use Tweepy for that. Um, Tweepy has as much confusion as Twitter's API does. Uh, to use the V1 API, you're going to use the API endpoint, uh, and it's the OAuth 1 user handler. Uh, and that gives you access to version 1. If you need to use version 2, which you will, you need to use the client endpoint. Uh, and then you can use the endpoints in however you choose to, and we'll We'll talk about how I did it in just a second. Um, so that is that is the walkthrough on getting access to the Twitter API and utilizing it um, via a wonderful tool called Tweepy. You can get pip install Tweepy, and that will allow you to uh, send tweets and read tweets and follow, unfollow, DM, block, report, do all the things you want to do using Twitter's API. So that's only half, well, that's only a third of the story. <laughs> the second is learning about these things called Azure storage queues. And what is a storage queue in general? Uh, before I get into the, the technical aspect, I, I want you to think about what a queue would look like. Uh, let's say if, if you're in the US, you're at the post office and you have a package and you, you're waiting in line with your package and then you know the next person in line, next person in line, next person in line, finally it's your turn. And they say, well, what would you like to do? And you, you give them all your information and you give them the package and you pay for shipping and postage and all that. Uh, and then you walk out the door only to see that you left a letter in your car. Well, then you have to go grab that letter and you walk back in line and, and sit down. And yeah, you're, you know, you, you do the whole line thing again. You, you go get in the back of the line and you wait until you're all the way back in front again. And then you go through that process again. And then you can finally leave when you're done. This is kind of what storage queues are. Um, instead of being a database, they're actually uh, a storage object. So they, they sit in kind of a, a cloud storage, a cloud blob storage, and they, they're in a queue. And what you're allowed to do is you're allowed to have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these items in queue and they'll be given an ID, they'll be given a queue count, uh, which is important, 
and then they'll be given their content or basically what they have to deliver. And then there's also an expiration date. So if let's say that the item took too long, then it goes away and you know just kind of disappears. So when the person calls next in line, instead of being deleted, what it does is that it immediately goes back to the end of the line by changing its DQ count. Uh, so then it'll go to the next item and same pattern occurs and I'll say next in line again. And then it goes back up to the front because everyone has been served. Now, if you tell it to delete afterwards, it will actually do that. So then when you say the next in line, it does the thing. And then after that, all that's left is that original is that that second object, the one that hasn't been done yet. And then once the queue is fully exhausted, it's fully exhausted. So I've talked about kind of like that package, that item, that content that gets passed in. What is valid? So the things that are valid are either encoded bytes, uh, strings. They do have to be UTF strings. I think if it's in by, if it's encoded bytes, it has to be ANSI. Um, but the nice thing about that is because it's a string and because it'll accept UTF strings, we can use JSON. So don't think about it as just a, a simple message. Think about it as an entire payload that you can pass in to your content piece. So how do you set up these Azure storage queues? Well, the first thing you have to do, and I have a little video here showing you, you're going to have to create a resource group. This is using Azure's CLI. Um, that way, if you're on you know, Mac, PC, Linux, uh, you can just install the CLI. But again, you're going to run, you're going to create your resource group. And then from there, you're going to create a storage account. Uh, there are other ways to do this. This was the easiest one that would fit on the slides. If you want to learn more, there's a link there on how to create it. it it's two commands. Uh, and then you're going to need to go and get access to that queue. Notice we just created the storage accounts. We didn't even name our queues yet. So when we do that, there is a, a little command that you can run that says, you know, Oh, I'm sorry. I don't think I actually added the queue, the actual command for the queue. Oh, yes, I did right here. Uh, Azure storage account show connection string. That is the command that you can provide. It'll give you this really long connection string endpoint that you can copy. And then inside of Python, you can pip install azure.storage.queue. And from there, you'll import azure.storage.queue. Uh, and then you can have a queue client and you'll use the class method from connection string. And then you give it your really long connection string that was here and you give it the queue name. And from there you have a queue, you have a, a segment of objects that allow you to, you know, create your line. Now, once you're there, you need to add your queue. You add to the queue by providing a queue message. Uh, or sending a message to the queue. Now, I actually had a, a function that said queue message, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But from there, you can basically just loop over the items and tell them to all get in line. And that's what I did. I had a, a list, a CSV spread, a CSV list of all of these items that needed to live in the queue. And I just said, hey, enumerate through this list. First, try to create the queue to make sure it exists. And then if it doesn't exist, create it. If it does exist, then that's okay. And then we're gonna send all those up. But if you notice here, I'm passing in kind of this, this little strange message of like index and in message and, and things like that. Don't worry, we'll get there. It'll, it'll all make sense in the future, I guess. So once we add to the queue, we can then pull from the queue. And when we say receive queue, what we get is that same JSON string. We get that same, you know, index, the index number, and then the text and all of that. And that's all inside of our string. So that's the message. Now we're doing, again, we're doing like receive message. Technically it's actually like it's queue receive message. And then some, you want to get the content of it. Uh, and that's what would return this JSON string. So this is actually queue receive message dot content. So if you noticed in the in the original picture that I had, I actually had an image. I don't have enough time to talk about how I made that image. I will tell you, adding text overlays onto images are hard if things change. The image itself always stayed the same. The actual 
text was a variable links, multiple links. So some were like 500 characters. Some were like 40. So basically what I had to do is I had to create this pattern that said, you know, between this number and this number, if it were, if it was there, then make it this width. If it was there, make it this width, make it if it's there, make it this width. And then basically scale up as large as I possibly could until I hit the boundaries that I had set for the image. But if you look at this image here, that number 18 is actually the index that I passed in at the beginning. And the text is the actual text that was there. And then the 31 days of neurodivergence was just the campaign name that I gave it. So I would know where it came from. So we've, we've kind of talked about three main components to this, and, and there were kind of two that were really important. That was the, the first one, which was interacting with Twitter's API, which we, again, we didn't really have to talk too much about because we're going we're gonna to wrap it up in just a second on that. And then we had this whole concept of storage queues. And if you notice, there's a lot of individual things that you have to keep track of. You have to keep track of your API keys. You have to keep track of your queue name and your connection string and all those things. Uh, I actually showed this to my team and they said, well, we could make this a little fun. And what we did was say, well, Azure storage queues plus Tweepy equals AZQ Tweeter um, because naming is fun. <laughs> and what AZQ Tweeter does is actually allows you to store those, those values um, either in environment variables or directly. And then you can just pass in one object that says QTweeter. And as you are interfacing with that, it is sending those commands behind the scenes. So let's look at our order of operations here. The first one that we have is uh, receive message, which basically says, hey, what is next in queue? And then we wanna do our message transformer which is going to give us all of our Twitter arguments. And those Twitter arguments are, uh, what's the file name? So that we could, we could take our newly created image and upload that to Twitter. And then from there, when we send our tweet, we will embed that file, that media ID, because Twitter requires you to upload the file first, and then send a tweet referencing the file ID. And then once we're done, we have to send that delete signal. Uh, remember, Azure Storage Keys by default will not delete your content. It will just move it to the back of the line and make it, technically it'll make it invisible for a certain a period of time that you have to set, or I think by default it's like 30 seconds. But once you tell it, I want this to delete, you send that pop receipt. Again, this is, this is a lot of things. With AZQ Tweeter, we clean it up just a little bit. Uh, we, we create our little function. This is our message transformer. We say we want this content to be these things. Uh, there's our file name. Here's our file so that we can reference it. And then when we trigger our message, we want it to say send next message. That's it. The message transformer is the function that we provided up top that gets thrown into a Lambda that gets ran. Preview mode is false because we could tell it, hey, we, we just want to see what the next message would be and it would show us that, but we say, no, we, we trust you. And then lastly, we're going to delete the message after. In this case, we didn't delete it and I will explain why we didn't delete it uh, in just a second. And the end result is you get, an, uh, you get an object on Twitter. Now, unfortunately, I'm looking at my, my slides here and my camera, so I can't really see if there were any questions, but I do wonder if someone said, why would you not just use a database? Why would you not just use a JSON file? Why would you not use an ETL pipeline? Uh, one, ETL pipeline is very expensive. Uh, I would not suggest that, uh, at least not in this way. But you're right. Why would I not use a database um, or something like that? Well, one simple answer is cost. In most cases, your database will make up the largest portion of your actual costs, your operating costs. And for me to run this campaign for a month, it cost me a total of six cents because I used Azure storage queues instead of a traditional database. I have also tested this in a database and it's greater than six cents. We'll just say that. Um, but as you can see, I used Azure functions to run this on a cron job and that only took, that cost me less than a penny. 
also I had I was able to do threat protection to check my images. I was able to, you know, pay the cost of bandwidth. All in all, I would say I think it would have cost Azure more to bill me than it did for me to actually run this service, which means I can scale it up significantly more than other resources. So as we get ready to wrap up, I do want to talk about that idea of an ETL. While I don't think that this could replace an ETL at all, I do think that this could serve as your own little personal ETL. In fact, I encourage you, make it yours. If you want to do something like this, don't do a manual input. Automate the input. Use things like GitHub Actions to, to bring items in, like we're doing with our podcast, so that we can send out tweets whenever we get new content to talk about. Use things like RSS to automatically post to federated services when you uh, publish to your blog or when you create a new YouTube video. Uh, your automation layer can be entirely up to you. As long as you can wrap it in a Lambda function, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, just be sure to throw it in that message transformer. And then take that desired output and send it wherever. I sent it to Twitter. You can send it wherever you'd like, but ultimately it's up to you. And if you have any ideas, be sure to let me know. Uh, we're actually working on scaling this up so that it can do more than just send tweets. Uh, there's going to be a lot of work there. But if you want to help with that work, uh, there's the repo there. It's az-q-tweeter. Uh, the name will probably change soon. So be sure to follow me on Twitter at the moment, uh, at KJYMiller. And of course, you can reach me on my website. Uh, it's right there. And just go to slash contact, uh, and that'll send me an email. And that being said, I want to thank you so much for coming to my talk, and I hope you have a fun time automating your Twitter experience. Well, thank you, Jay, for your excellent <laughs> talk. It was very interesting. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that, and we'll be coming back for more. Uh, yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much. I don't know if the questions in there were. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, it's a question that says, well, <laughs> are you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but I think there's no questions. Okay. I can answer that one. I, while I do have an account, I am not currently on Mastodon. I don't have any problems with it. Um, I'm actually taking this time to kind of stop consuming as much social media and actually start producing things for it. So. Great. <laughs> well, I think that's all for you. There are people clapping for your talk? And awesome. yes. Thank you, Jay.